is an amazing piece of paper because this is a piece of paper that has the power to save lives and protect people. And it's taken a lot of people from many countries more than 10 years to bring it into being. This is the Arms Trade Treaty, and it's the first treaty to regulate the trade in conventional arms, the guns, bullets, battleships and tanks that kill people every day around the world. And what I want to talk to you about are 10 lessons that I've learned from 10 years of working on this campaign. So firstly, why did we work on it as Oxfam? We're an aid agency. What were we doing being involved in arms control? The simple reason is that armed violence makes poverty much worse. There's a huge link between the two. It's not just the one person that dies every minute as a result of armed violence. It's the millions more that are forced from their homes, who suffer oppression and abuse, who can't get access to markets, to schools, and who can't improve their lives. So we wanted to do something about this. In 2003, we launched a campaign calling for the arms trade to be brought under control. And we wanted something quite simple. We wanted an end to the system where arms dealers can just ply their trade with impunity anywhere they want around the world, and weapons flood into some of the world's worst conflict zones. And the scenes that we see every day on TV in Syria, in the Central African Republic, in Congo, and in many other places prevail. We wanted governments to take responsibility and to have to authorise, to say yes or no to every arm that leaves their country, comes through their country, or um, uh, and, uh, leaves, uh, uh, passes through it in a, in a transit way. And they have to do that against a set of rules based quite simply on human rights and humanitarian law. So we're trying to put human rights and humanitarian law rather than profit at the heart of the arms trade. So we launched this campaign Three governments said that they supported it, Mali, Cambodia, and Costa Rica. The rest thought we were crazy. They said it's an impossible idea. The arms trade is huge. There's too many vested interests. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. You'll never make it work. And maybe that's the first lesson, is that you need tenacity. And when you start a campaign, you should be aiming high. And if governments aren't telling you your ideas are crazy, then maybe you're not aiming high enough. But it changed. We turned that around. We went from the ideas are crazy to I found myself celebrating the adoption of the Arms Trade Treaty with William Hague at the Foreign Office last year when he was saying what a success this campaign had been. Governments at the UN were queuing up to have their photos taken with our We Made History signs on the day that the treaty was adopted. So how did we, how did we get there? How did we um, reach that point? Well, the next lesson, I think, is about getting um, your issue onto the agenda. You need to raise the profile of your, of your topic. We used a lot of campaigning actions, campaigning stunts, to try to draw attention to the problems of the arms trade. We tried to use the weapons themselves, in this case driving a tank around the streets of London, to call attention to the fact that this was a major problem and that governments needed to act. And then the next lesson was going global. If you want to work on a big campaign that's about changing the fundamentals of a, of, a, of a global system, then you can't do it by yourself. You need to work in coalition and you need to get global and work with others around the world. So we did. We had many countries, many partners, many NGOs that were involved in this campaign. And that really helped us to, to build that success. Our political strategy at the beginning, when we only had these three small countries supporting us, was to try to find one government in every region that would say, yes, the arms trade treaty is important, yes, I back this campaign. And our theory was, if we got one country in every region, then it would start to roll and it would start to build up. And it did. We moved by 2005, over 50 governments had said at the UN, yes, we support the idea of the arms, of the arms trade treaty. We would began to get things to move and we would began to get the momentum to build. The next lesson is about the importance of being able to adapt. When we launched this campaign, we had the idea of trying to put faces onto the faceless arms trade. We launched the Million Faces petition, which was quite simply where you took a photo of yourself or a self-portrait and sent it in. We would get a million of these and present them at the UN. And we, launched, we were a bit ahead of our time. We launched this years ahead of the smartphone. If we did it now, it would be the 10 Million Faces campaign in an instant. But back then, we actually literally had people going out with cameras on the streets, taking photos and painstakingly uploading them. 
them. We had people drawing their, their self-portraits in many countries around the world. But it did get its in-depth engagement. In Kenya, 60,000 people drew their self-portrait for this campaign. And all of those people had taken part in a workshop or a seminar or an in-depth discussion or were directly affected by the problems we were talking about. So we got a lot of good engagement. But then we adapted as technology changed and as things moved on. We started using social media. We started using Facebook, Twitter, and so on, to the extent that our use of Twitter and the hashtag that we developed, Arms Treaty, became a story itself um, in, with some of the media that was covering the treaty. And again, we adapted. We thought we wanted to use Twitter because we wanted to reach out to so many more people around the world. It was a global engagement tool. Actually, we found it most effective on being able to tweet directly to diplomats who would follow our posts avidly and would talk to us about it every day in the, in the UN conference halls. We also used infographics, simple images, to demonstrate complicated points. The topic of gifting, the way in which governments can um, transfer arms without any remuneration being involved and therefore get around regulation, is a complicated topic. A nice simple graphic like this sums it up quite easily what we're trying to say. And this particular one was reposted many, many times when we shared it. We're still doing that now as we're, as we're pushing to encourage more and more countries to sign and ratify the treaty now that it's been been adopted. And we similarly tried to use simple messages to convey the powerful concepts that we were talking about. This quote that we used about, isn't it ridiculous that the global trade in bananas is subject to more regulation than the deadly trade in machine guns, was picked up in almost every media centre around the world and was widely quoted in, in many different languages. And it led us to then adapt and use bananas and um, uh, media stunts and activities with bananas as a way to, to get this point across. Um, the UN themselves started using it. Ban Ki-moon um, spoke about this quote when he welcomed the treaty being, being adopted. The next lesson is about knowing your, knowing your stuff and getting your facts right. Um, we all know this from campaigns, the importance of, of the policy report, the importance of knowing your details. But for us, it was about having some statistics, really researching those and making sure they were right and pushing them out widely. It was also about coming up with different angles on the topic. So one report down there on the, on the bottom left, Africa's Missing Billions, that we bid, did back in 2007, was about the economic cost to Africa of armed violence. We estimate that armed violence costs Africa $18 billion a year um, it, um, a, a, as, a, as a result of the arms trade being out of control. That's about the same amount of money that the continent receives in aid. It's a very powerful argument, but it's a different one from uh, the, the humanitarian one that we began with. African governments in particular found this really powerful and I think that statistic is one that I've heard quoted again and again and again particularly by African governments at the UN it's become a very powerful um, argument to bring the arms trade under control the next is about uh, lesson is about um, remembering why you're working on your issue and working with survivors. This is Julia Cirillo. He was our millionth um, supporter, our millionth face, who came with us to the UN in 2006. A former armed violence perpetrator, an armed cattle raider from Western Kenya. He gave up his gun for running shoes as part of an Oxfam peace project. He's now become a, a semi-professional runner. This is him with his medal when he came fourth in the New York Marathon last October, which is an amazing achievement. But Working with him and other survivors who were always part of our teams at the UN and in different conferences around the world was a way that we ensured we were keeping our own message real, but also that they were very much part of our team and part of shaping our policy and messages and part of talking directly to diplomats. It might be easy to dismiss someone like me talking to a diplomat saying you need to make these changes. It's quite difficult when you're talking to Prasad there in the middle um, in his wheelchair, a former Pakistani. Um, a military guy who um, um, has suffered as a direct result of armed violence and conflict and is making a very powerful case. Or Pauline on the back right who lost five members of her family to gun violence in Jamaica. Very powerful arguments put directly to decision makers. Similarly, we worked with um, public figures, celebrities. This is Jaiman Honsu, from, famous from the film Blood Diamonds and others. 
um, him, he, uh, himself from, from uh, uh, a heritage going back to Benin. Uh, he talked eloquently at the UN about the trip he made with Oxfam to South Sudan, which brought back his own memories of childhood in Africa, but also um, the suffering that he, he saw. It helped us to exacerbate our message, to, to take it out to a wider audience, as did Helen Mirren, a long-time supporter of the campaign, whom we've worked with for more than a decade. But it's got to be real engagement. If you're working with public figures, then it needs to be public figures who actually do believe in your issue and do really want to be part Part of it and stay with you. Um, and this is a, a, a shot of a woman surveying the devastation around her home in Syria, remembering the real reason why you're doing it and bringing that story directly is such an important part of campaigning. It's easy to get um, distracted into the technical details, the, detail, the policy arguments. It's easy for diplomats to, to, to get stuck on the technical issues and forget the people. Keeping it real and bringing those stories to the fore was really important. Another thing that we worked on was working with some interesting alliances, some different um, approaches. We've got a, um, a statement of support there from the European defence industry. We did work with the defence industry in the UK and in other countries in Europe, and they did voice their support for the arms trade treaty. They wanted to be seen as the responsible end of the arms trade. Some of them were convinced by our arguments too and wanted to support that. We never managed to go as, get as far as getting um, US US uh, arms companies to publicly support the treaty, but the support of so many European manufacturers did mean that US companies didn't speak out against it, which was a kind of behind the scenes, a hidden but very important aspect of our, of our campaign. Similarly, we worked with financial investors who also issued a, a statement of support. Again, the economic arguments. Economic stability comes when you don't have high levels of conflict and armed violence. We got a statement um, that uh, added together from investors was worth $3 trillion um, worth of investment companies put their support behind the arms trade treaty. Again, a different angle which reached out to different governments. And then... At the UN itself, the alliances that we made with, with governments from around the world um, was really important. We worked with lots of governments from the Global South, with progressive governments. These guys here are two ambassadors from Trinidad and Tobago, a government maybe not seen as a major player on the global stage, but working together in a progressive group with others from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Mexico, from Norway, became a very powerful group that we worked with um, collectively. And this is why it was important, because at the top, that's what it's like at the UN or at the global stage of foreign policy issues. The big fish like to dominate the agenda. The big fish are the ones who call the rules and say, you can't change this, this is how it is. But we changed that. I think we worked together with a group of governments over a long period of time where we built up strong trust and relationships. We worked with colleagues and NGOs, partners from around the world, and we helped to turn that around. The little fish got together and said, actually, we are going to change these rules and we are going to turn this around. And the big, the big countries, uh, the big players, Russia, China, the US, you're not going to stop this because we are going to make this happen. Um, this is a, a, just a picture of a meeting, but it's an interesting one because it's taken at midnight um, in one of the, the embassies of, of one of our progressive government partners at the UN. And it's something that we were doing a lot, working with those governments to formulate strategy, develop tactics and ideas. And this is, part, this is what it helped us lead to. Um, this is Jones Appler, the ambassador from Ghana, reading out a statement on behalf of 108 countries, saying this draft text of the treaty, this is about halfway through the first set of negotiations, it's not strong enough, and we demand that you make this a stronger treaty that's going to protect our, our citizens and, and our families around the world. And we worked with Jones to build up support for that, for that statement. It started off with one country, went to another country, and then another, and suddenly there were 108 countries, more than half the UN that supported it, and it laid down a challenge in the negotiations, and things started to change. And we did this again and again on, on, on lots of different topics. The other issue around, as well as knowing your, knowing your people in, the, in, in this instance, is knowing your process. It's just as important in a big campaign that's lasting over many years that you have issues on, on substance and, and policy detail. You also need to have experts on process. The rule of consensus 
And if you've ever done anything at the UN, it's something which can often block and stop things happening. It's where one country can say, I don't agree, and everything grinds to a halt. And it's the rule by which lots of processes like negotiations take place. And it happened to us in July 2012, when at the end of the conference, the United States representative put up his hand and said, Mr. President, we need, we need more time. The diplomatic way of saying, I'm pulling the rug, the show's over. Now, that stopped, the, that stopped negotiations flat in July 2012, but we worked with our group of governments and we studied precedents from other processes and we found some language that we could get into the resolution that was going to mandate the next set of negotiations, which meant that if that happened again, we could flip this process over to the General <coughs> Assembly, the UN General Assembly, which is based on rules of voting. Two-thirds majority are needed to get things agreed at the UN. And that's what happened. The final set of negotiations for the ATT were blocked on the final day by a wonderful alliance of Syria, North Korea and Iran who said, we do not agree with this treaty. Probably wouldn't, if it was a treaty they thought was wonderful, we probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have been one that we, we, we wanted anyway. So it, it was okay because we had this plan ready. The minute that happened, we went with a group of governments, put down a resolution at the General Assembly and said, we now want to take this text and have it adopted. That worked. It was... A, it was um, adopted by overwhelming vote, 154 states voted in favour and only those three against, and the treaty was, treaty was adopted. So uh, th th this shot is up there because it's about um, having this big global coalition that I talked about, but also sometimes it's a relatively small team that's working to make things happen and to lead things moving on. Yes, we were a big campaign, but actually in the grand scheme of big campaigns, um, we, weren't, we weren't that huge. We were um, geographically diverse. We had colleagues from all over the world, but it's a relatively small team that, that stuck on this and worked on it and developed strategy and ideas to keep it going. You don't always need to have lots of people and lots of money to achieve change. Sometimes you need smart ideas and, and a lot of tenacity. Um, and coming, coming to the end, it's about how you can change um, the, the, the rules of the game, how you can change the issues that are, are seen as important. I've put this quote up there because this is from um, the, at the time, new foreign minister from Australia last year coming in, a new right-wing Australian government, not, not a pro um, development or pro-aid government. One of their first acts was to abolish their aid department and absorb it into their, their foreign affairs team. But this is that same foreign minister um, speaking to Oxfam International's director up there, Winnie Bionema, saying, thank you, Oxfam, for underscoring the importance of armed violence and development. It's a really big thing that you did there. This is now an established concept um, in, in the UN. Similarly, I remember very well the meeting in 2010 I went to at the UK Foreign Office where we introduced the idea of gender-based violence being a, one of the criteria we wanted in the treaty that governments had to think of. And the spluttering answer of ridicule, what next, do you want fishermen in the treaty, Oxfam? How ridiculous. And then this is the Deputy Prime Minister again last year saying and welcoming how brilliant it is that gender-based violence is in the treaty. And the ATT is the first treaty to specifically include the term gender-based violence within its provisions. That's an important step forward, not just for arms control, but hopefully for other areas that are trying to deal with the important issue of tackling gender-based violence. You can change the rules of the, the, rules of the game. Um, and so then just coming on to the, the, the final point then of, of how, how things can change. This is the voting board at the UN from 2006 when uh, the arms trade treaty was first introduced. The big red no in the middle is from the United States, the only government that publicly said no. Many, uh, 24 who abstained, but one who said no. This is the head of the US delegation at the end of the 2012 negotiations when the US had, had stopped negotiations. He'd blocked consensus and the media crowd round to ask why, why did this happen? This is our, our colleagues at Amnesty International criticising the Obama administration for stunning cowardice in <coughs> stopping this important treaty going forward. And this is the United States um, Senator Kerry signing the arms trade treaty last year. Change can happen. You can make the impossible possible. That is a, that's our job. And sometimes 
um, it, 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 it can take place. And uh, Secretary of State Kerry there also for the first time acknowledging the role of civil society. A big deal. Many states have acknowledged the role of civil society in this process. This was the first time the, the US um, made such a, such a statement. A big, a big change in their, in their view. And this is... Um, a shot of the um, trying to get in. This is a picture I took on my iPhone, trying to get into the negotiations on the final day um, of, of arms trade treaty negotiations in March 2013. And it's significant because thinking back to that first picture in 2003 when we had three governments who supported this idea and the rest who thought it was a, a mad idea and it could never happen when it was impossible. This was every government in the world fighting to get into that room. There were so many of them that there literally were some fights at the door. UN security threw everybody out. They brought the police. They had to set up a second room with TV screens so that things could go ahead. They all wanted to be there. This was such an important day. They were there because the arms trade is out of control and things have to change, things have to be um, brought under control. They were there because this was an idea whose time had come and enough governments believed it was time to change. And they were there because we made them be there. Because we kept at this campaign from this initial, initial vision 10 years ago, we didn't let that go, and we said we are going to make the impossible possible. And that's the biggest lesson and the most important lesson, I think, is to know your power. That for all the difficulties of working on campaigns, the difficulties in working coalition when you have so many different ideas that often clash, the many setbacks there are, the many times that things are blocked, and it seems it will never change. You do have power. You can make things move along. And sticking to it, having, having a, being prepared to adapt, being prepared to work with others, being prepared to change your ideas, means that you can't just help change um, and move a campaign along. You might just help to change the world. Thank you.